It's now my favorite time of the program where our panel of experts will tell us what to expect in the coming year. I believe last year we correctly predicted that Elon would acquire Twitter and that Beyonce would drop a new album. So we're looking good for this year. Uh, please join me in welcoming our panelists leading this session, Rachel Prophet of Cooley, joined by Ed Batts of Gibson Dunn, Steve Lippin of Gladstone Place Partners, Paul Scrivano of Davis Polk, and Brittany Skoda of Morgan Stanley. Are we ready? All right. So I am Rachel Prophet, a corporate security <coughs> partner at Cooley, uh, based here in our San Francisco office. Uh, I am going to tee up the session and then let our esteemed panelists introduce themselves so nothing is lost in translation. Um, after a decade of reasonably predictable markets, uh, where valuations were steady, uh, if not climbing, even through a global pandemic, here we are. <clears throat> so as uh, our introducer noted, we will do our best to talk about state of play um, and potentially talk about forward-looking trends that we think might be making a comeback. Uh, but before we do that, I will look to my left. Stephen, have you kick off introductions? Great. Hi. Steve Lippin from Gladstone Place. We're a strategic communications firm uh, in New York with a partner and office in San Francisco. I'm Ed Batts. I'm a corporate partner in the Palo Alto office of Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher. Do a kind of classic valley mix of M&A and capital market securities work. Brittany Skoda, Morgan Stanley. I run our global software banking business, so that means IPOs, M&A, capital raise, everything in between. I'm Paul Scrivano. I'm a partner at Davis Polk and Wardwell. I head the M&A practice on the West Coast. My practice is exclusively M&A, public and private, um, negotiated and hostile. And uh, as of late, a heavy mix of activist defense work, which will likely continue. Thank you all for being here. Um, before we get into <clears throat> trends that we think we may see going forward, I would love to talk a bit about and hopefully have a conversation about what we are seeing uh, in our particular client bases. Um, obviously, those of us in the room can read the news and understand that interest rates are in a not a great place and the uh, capital markets are all but closed. Um, but it would be awesome to understand, and I'll let, leave it to whoever would like to kick off, you know, what you are seeing uh, in the macro environment that's affecting our client base. Well, you know, I'll just start quickly about, we're just about through the end of earnings season, and um, obviously rates rising, fears of recession, um, most of our clients do pretty well earnings-wise, a um, couple of hiccups, but overall, corporate America is, is still in a relatively strong position. We could talk about layoffs, et cetera. Obviously, there was news this morning with Meta. Um, but in terms of the practice, I'd say M&A remains very quiet. Um, activism has picked up considerably, and we'll talk about it later, but a lot of issuers are getting ready for the season. Um, and then, um, you know, pressure from shareholders with stock price down is something else that, that we'll, we'll talk about. But at least for now, M&A, IPOs, and SPACs, which have been big drivers for us, um, remain, you know, pretty quiet. Yeah, and to, and to pick up on M&A, I mean, you know, coming off of 2021, which was, you know, a record year and, and frankly unsustainable at, at, that, at that, uh, that level, 2022, at least the first half, started off reasonably well. I mean, it was less than 2021, but if you look back to 2018, 2019, about at that level, Q3 or so, there's been, there's been a lot of headwinds, uh, a lot of challenges, and um, it, it, has, it has slowed considerably. It's become more difficult to get deals done. Uh, adding to that mix, the, the financing markets, the Leadfin markets have become quite challenged as of late. Uh, there were a number of deals struck at the beginning of 2022, and, the, and a lot of that paper is sitting on the bank's balance sheets uh, at large losses, uh, like the, the Citrix deal, Twitter, Lumen, you know, there's a number of them. And so that, that challenge is likely to continue at least through the rest of, of 2022, um, certainly having an effect on sponsors looking to do deals of, of size and even strategics looking to do deals of, of size. The way I'd characterize this environment is murky. It's not bad, but it's also not great. And we've been in now this period of volatility for the better part of a year. Tech valuations are off 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent, so, so meaningfully. Uh, and that has meant it's been difficult for many companies to get public. So just as some context, 
there was 124 tech IPOs last year. This year, there's been a whopping two. <laughs> so very different environment, and nobody wants to go public when there's so much volatility, but then there's also a, a materially different valuation environment, and so many companies are looking out saying, well, that's not an attractive outcome, and you know, we're still in this place in the capital markets, which is impacting M&A and IPOs, which is public investors keep waiting. Is there another shoe to drop? Is there something we're missing? Is it going to get worse from here? And it feels like increasingly the answer to that question is yes. Earnings have been fine, but like if we kind of track Q1 to Q2 to Q3, there's less companies beating and raising. There's more companies holding their guidance. There's some companies bringing in guidance big question mark, particularly in software land, of where do IT budgets ultimately get set? And we're not gonna really have a good handle on that until we round out the corner of this year as the planning is finalizing. So I think you're gonna see IPO activity still be muted. And M&A activity, I think, will be the first to pick up in a meaningful way, but it's gonna happen when the, the world feels a little bit more settled. And there's agreement on the valuations, right? Uh, because you've got a a mismatch right now, if you're a public company seller, you're looking at last year's price and going, why would I sell to a premium of 20 to 30 percent for this year's price when that's still lower than what I was sitting at last year at market? I think the, the green shoots that we see are on the private side. You know, private companies, the runway that they have for additional capital has decreased, if not evaporated. Right. So a year ago, if you were having a, a, a founder conversation, the founder might say, well, look, I've got, I've got an M&A term sheet. It's good enough. But I've got this great financing term sheet. It's not, not really dilutive. It'll extend my runway by 24 months. We'll talk about M&A. Nice day. Have a nice day, right? Uh, see you soon. See you soon. Uh, that conversation doesn't exist anymore, right? And now it's become how much cash do I have left? It's gone from a race for revenue growth to a race for operating income and profitability, and it's that classic part of the cycle. Those of us who have been doing this for a while, this is probably the third time I've been kind of at the <laughs> precipice and you're going down. And I, what I worry about is um, not so much are there opportunities for strategics where are my clients, public companies, to go out and find interesting tuck-ins, particularly ones below 101 million where they don't have to show their head for antitrust approval. Uh, but the psychology, when you have significant rifts, reduction in forces, there's an optic for a buyer to go out and then simultaneously do an acquisition, you know, two weeks later, right? So I think we're going to be in a little bit of a pause mode. I completely agree with Brittany as folks kind of psychologically work out where the, where the market matches from a financial perspective and where the outlook matches from a psychological market behavioral perspective. You keyed up that next question perfectly. So how, how do people get deals done in a market like this, right? Because some of them will, in fact, run out of the cash runway, um, Debt is nearly impossible to get at the prices. I mean, maybe you can get it, but nobody wants to pay for it. What What are the levers that will pull? What What kind of deal will get deals will get put together in this climate? Well, you know what we're starting to see. I mean, it, it's hard to get leverage finance deals done, but you are seeing opportunistic buyers for sure, and the classic PE or you know alternative asset managers, and you're seeing. Um, I think you're going to see opportunistic strategics who, whose balance sheets are, are still in pretty good shape. Uh, I agree they're not going to rush into anything, but I, I do think you're, you know, uh, the biz dev teams and CEOs and CFOs have that list um, in their draw of deals they want to do. And to your point about prices getting down 50, 70 percent, those lists are coming back out. They're taking a look at them. They're getting the corp dev teams revved up. You know, whether we see deals, I don't know, but it, it does feel like um, those that are well armed um, are going to be opportunistic because I think there are a lot of actual interesting buys in there mm -hmm. if you can get deals done. Well, um, go ahead. It's going to require some creativity as well, uh, particularly on the part of, of sellers and, and buyers. I mean, we may start seeing more you know, seller financing in some of these deals. We may start seeing more stock components. There's a difference between public and private, too. The public markets... <clears throat> reset, you know, downward, the private markets, that, that reset is still happening. Mm -hmm. And there's always, there always seems to be an eight to 10 month delay, it seems, before the private valuations reset it, it, at that right level. Um, you know, it's interesting, though, what throughout all of this, the, the terms that we're seeing in these deals haven't yet been affected by the downturn. And, and what I mean is, 
it is still relatively seller-friendly terms that we are seeing in a lot of processes and, and a lot of deals, things like no indemnity deals, narrow fraud carve-outs, uh, limited closing conditions, meaningful regulatory obligations buyers are undertaking, very quick periods from final bid to signing. Uh, and and we, we continue to see the continued push of rep and warranty insurance displacing seller indemnities, even in strategic to strategic mm. deals, which wasn't always the case. And a lot of that's putting more, more pressure on buyers doing diligence and the right diligence before they sign, particularly on finance and tax and, and things affecting purchase price. But it, it's going to require a lot of creativity in this market. When deals are going to start getting done, there's no question, and if anything, a little bit by need. If a company needs capital, there's only so many paths. You're either going to find the capital or you're going to ultimately find another home. Or in some cases, you're not going to sell for cash. You're going to join a bigger, a bigger uh, partner, and really one plus one equals three, and you're hoping together you can go ride that upside. And so it's not always... Sometimes we like to think about M&A as broken companies. Sometimes it's awesome companies looking to accelerate the opportunity in a different context. And private equity, even through this year, has been pretty active. They have $3 trillion of capital to put to work. So you've seen the likes of Atoma and Vista and you know, H&F and Premira you know, go and do that. And then I think the comment on strategics is absolutely right. There's a lot of dusting off that shopping list. And strategics for tech companies are the old guard. You know, so who you think of, like, we'll call it Oracle, SAP, you know, Microsoft, companies that have bought companies over and over, but also a newer guard of companies that have gone public in the last, you know, five to ten years uh, that could start to be active. And then you have, like, older school industrial companies looking to involve their businesses as well. And so there's lots of capital that wants to go after this tech opportunity and it's just a matter of time as this environment settles in that I think sellers are going to be willing to transact where a lot of these buyers are willing to pay. And, and I agree on the private sponsor side, unlike prior cycles, there's a willingness now. Paul's entirely correct. Uh, syndicated left fin deals have had real issues, right? But there are private lenders, private credit lenders, and the equity checks are larger now. So there's a lot of capital to deploy, use banker terminology, uh, spare powder uh, to use. Um, and so I don't think LBOs are completely dead, uh, but maybe of a smaller size and scope and, and fewer number. The other point I would point out is, you know, this is not just a U.S. market. A lot of the companies in the Valley are looking at cross-border transnational deals. The dollar is strong. It's a strong currency overseas. And there are regulatory issues overseas. Uh, the first one I would note is, you know, there is a strategic ongoing decoupling from China, for better or for worse, in many areas. Uh, the BIS announcements from a few weeks ago on the increased regulation of the semiconductor space are indicative of that. And then separate from that, you know, I think there's been a little bit of a thaw in antitrust. I don't want to touch wood. And if my <laughs> friends at the CMA are watching, I greet them and say hello. But um, generally speaking, you hear a fewer and fewer deals getting hitched up with notable uh, uh, exceptions, particularly in the EU from time to time, but there are plenty of deals getting done internationally and in a strong currency where the, the comparative arbitrage is there, it will make sense for our, our Bay Area-based companies to look around and US-based companies to look around and say, what is opportunistically within our wheelhouse? So obviously, again, start even as recently as today, you can look around and see the sort of the right sizing that many of the companies are doing Meta, Stripe, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How much of that internal housekeeping do you think is affecting deal volume and cadence as well, right? Do you think that there's just more of an internal focus from the strategics that they need to do? They, they kind of need to evaluate their own strategy before they go and consider these tuck-in type deals. Do you, are you seeing any of that in your practice? Well, I was to say this to the end, and what Jamie alluded to is that fast firing is replacing quiet quitting. Um, <laughs> Because basically now you're, you're seeing these waves of layoffs and companies are both successful as companies that have missed. You really almost can't come out with a, a miss and not have a strategy to talk about mm -hmm. expense reductions and cost cutting. Um, and, and they, you know, our, our clients could do both at the same time. Um, but I would say that generally speaking, um, our, our corporate clients are looking at their 23 budgets, if not already set them, and really doing a lot of belt tightening. 
Um, there's a lot of talk about a recession. Whether we have one or, or not, the sheer amount of talk mm -hmm. is actually prompting companies to be proactive about some of this cost cutting. Um, and I think for the most part, um, companies would like to go into 2023 put a leaner and leaner as they think about sort of their M&A appetite. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, I think that it, while it's certainly a factor, there's only so much, there's only so much you can do internally mm -hmm. and almost every company needs inorganic growth. And I think as they look around now, I mean, it is something of a unique opportunity, certainly for a buyer with cash on hand. Uh, and, and I wouldn't count out the sponsors on this either. You know, I mean, I, we talked about the Levfin markets being challenged, but sponsors are among some of the savviest deal doers. And if they have to, they'll resort to equity backstop deals and other, and other tactics to get things done. But I think for many companies, particularly in the tech space, which is so important out in this neck of the woods, to simply focus on just cutting costs here, you're going you're gonna to get left behind when your competitors are savvy and pragmatic and can weigh risk and can do deals that are strategic to them and will end up leaving you in the dust if you are not participating in that. There are definitely difficult tensions in planning right now because the capital markets, no question, want to see profitability. But time and time again, we've seen that be the case anytime there's a bearish market, which we're in, a risk-off market. But at some point, it's going to switch back again to be a more growth-oriented mm -hmm. environment. And so it is this thoughtful dance of, well, how do I right-size for this environment or mm -hmm. actually take the pain and be okay with it for now, meaning I'm going to keep spending because I think mm -hmm. that the reward on the other side of this environment is gonna continue to get there. And if you look at who are the highest valued uh, software companies or tech companies today, it's actually those who have it all. They have scale, they have growth, they have profit. And it's every one of those dimensions. And again, we talk a lot about profit, 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 but when we look at different rule of metrics, like rule of 40 is one that's a popular one to talk about. So your revenue growth plus your free cash flow margin, the more you index on growth on that scale, those companies tend to have higher multiples. And so it's very nuanced, I think, to the company situation of how much do you really want to cut? It, if, are you cutting at all? In some cases, people are letting natural attrition take care of it, and they're just not going to go and backfill those roles, which they would have done in a different environment. Uh, and then that has to kind of set where you sit competitively. Your unit economics have to set the stage for how you think about your plan. And, and there's a tactical and strategic, which is, you know, when you're in the midst of it at the moment, I think it's the eye of the hurricane. You get a couple of months beyond that, and you've got to figure out what, what's next. I would also point out you've got a large number of DSPAC companies that their viability as standalone entities are questionable, and <laughs> they're very cheap, right? And and the the... Interesting part about these facts, unlike prior cycles, is it's very easy to understand where they're at because they started all at 10 bucks. And if they're at 78 cents, you know that there's been a significant depreciation. And they're all at 78 cents. And they're all at <laughs> and If you're at $2, <laughs> you're at 56, $3, and you're golden, right? Um, and so how cheap can it go before some of these assets look very attractive to either roll up or to be an alternate adjacent parts of the space for horizontal, horizontal uh, uh, M&A deals? So that's part one. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's just a matter of time, uh, you know, I, I'll leave it to larger voices in the valley, but, you know, I think a number of these companies who are not doing the attrition only, who are doing some reductions, uh, proactive reductions and forth, it's not LIFO, it's not last in, first out, right? This is, you know, look, look at your human talent management and try to upgrade along the way and come out at the end of the cycle stronger. My, my last real caveat is we're not there yet, but I think we're going to get there. And if you're a restructuring partner at a large, big law firm, you're going, yeah, we're going to get there. But, you know, we haven't talked about 363 deals and bankruptcy restructurings and all that good stuff. But I got to imagine in a year, year and a half from now, the old bankruptcy auction will be back in our parlance and I'll be having discussions about, you know, what's an involuntary versus voluntary petition. Well, and some of that comes actually from a place that you, you might not think, which is a lot of these public companies, growth companies, kept raising money and raising convertibles in the public markets. And it was like a convert getting refinanced with a convert. And there's some companies where half of their market cap right now is debt. Yeah. But it's not like the older school, dusty companies that you think about, you know, that are in that situation. It's like real companies that we all 
all know. And so that's going to be an interesting dynamic because if the financing markets aren't there traditionally, there's going to be real capital structure gymnastics to work through. Well, and since our, our, our Twitter Lipton panel with Adam yesterday, Elon sold $5 billion of stock to presumably maybe fund Twitter. At least that was the, that was the speculation. So, you know, not to go back to that conversation, but you clearly have an un unstable balance sheet right there, and, and what happens, you know, it's going to be fascinating, and you know, and maybe one of the distressed opportunistic funds come along and, and take all the, the bank debt at seventy cents of a dollar, and somebody makes a killing off of it. So, Paul, I take your point earlier that um, private valuations are going to take a little bit to catch up, but obviously you can't hide in the public market, um, and I think that that's creating a bit of angst. Um, more or less, depending on the company you're in, um, in the boardroom, right? The activists are going to come, and I'd love to talk a little bit about what you're seeing and, frankly, extrapolate forward from what you've seen in the past in these sorts of cycles. It, it, it definitely is. And, you know, there's a number of things here. I mean, certainly just looking at activism uh, during 2022, I mean, it, it is on track to, to beat the average over the last three years. And you, you add a number of things into the mix here. So, I mean, activists are investing into a, you know, historic resetting downward of multiples. Add to that the universal proxy card rules and you know 14A9, uh, A19, which is most think is going to make it easier for activists to gain minority representation on boards. A and you you add all that together and you certainly are seeing we're seeing an uptick and we we think that it's going to be a rough 2023 proxy season for a lot of companies. I mean just taking a look at you know at stock prices and where they are. I mean, how many companies are at 52-week lows or, or close to it? Quite a few. Um, and a lot of this, is, so you're going to face pressure from activists, but you may also face pressure from other areas too. I mean, we talked a bit about companies not wanting to transact now because they remember what their stock price mm -hmm. was back in 2021. There may be market forces that get brought to bear that, that force that. Um, it is a unique buying opportunity at the moment for companies that have access to cash. And at some point, you can see this spilling out into the public with the seller doesn't want to transact and the buyer eventually says, I'm going to go straight to your stockholders because your stockholders may have a different view here, given where your valuation is and given the uncertainty mm -hmm. looking forward. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things at work right now, a lot, a, a lot of new risks that are coming to bear. I mean, we, we've been living the, the Russia-Ukraine war for most of 2022 here. It, it could materially worsen. We'll have to see. But there's a number of other risks. Inflation, interest rates, currency is even a risk these days, supply chain. Um, there's a number of other risks that are being brought to bear, all of which put a lot of pressure on public companies as to what are they going to do. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts on the activist piece you're seeing in your... I, I, so activists do principally three things, right? They come in, they ask for additional operational rigor. They take a look around and they say, well, maybe this company shouldn't be structured as it's structured. Mm -hmm. And so you start to get the split-offs and the spin-offs. <clears throat> we had a year of that, 14, 15-ish, when you know there were six big spins in the valley or so. Um, we're not quite there yet, but I could see it happening. Or they say, hang the for sale sign out and put yourself up for sale form a strategic committee, investigate your strategic opportunities, yada, yada. I don't see number three happening. It's a lot of number one. It's a lot of increased operational rigor. And it's not so much those that have taken the position yet. There are a couple of well-known, prominent examples in the past month or so. It's the deterrent effect to all the management teams to say, we better have our house in order just in case somebody comes in and makes that, right? So they'll hire the bankers and the lawyers for prep, but they'll also take independent action to start tightening the balance sheet, shoring it up, um, looking at operational income metrics, increasing their, their cash flow. And I, and I think that definitely is part of what's coming. I also would point out an interesting, in addition to the universal proxy card, uh, regulation NPX is coming out from the SEC, which will force large institutional holders to disclose their voting patterns on things like, say, on pay and golden parachutes and <coughs> M&A contexts. So you're going to see a lot more visibility. It, it also impacts how they lend shares out, but we'll put that aside. That's kind of a banker financial engineering type of thing. But uh, from a disclosure standpoint, you're going to see large funds starting to disclose, are, you know, how are they really acting in concert with an activist or not in an activist situation. And, and for a lot of public companies, now is the time to be thinking about what are your vulnerabilities? How often do you go and see your shareholders? Are you going to go and see them the moment the white paper shows up from Starboard <laughs> Value? It's too late. 
That's right. Thinking about that now, as Ed mentioned, you know, having a banker come in and, and do an analysis of where do we think our vulnerabilities are? How do we stack up against our peers? Are there, biz are there business segments that, that someone could claim really should be split off as another public company? Take the time now to do that. Um, you know, 14A19 with the universal proxy card rules, it, it's also a good time now for a lot of public companies to think about, should I be tightening up my bylaws? Many companies haven't looked at their bylaws for five to 10 years. Now might be the time. Um, do it on a clear day because it, it's likely to be a rough 2023. There's a, a saying that a lot of, that we're using with a lot of companies right now, which is be your own activist. And you know, to this point on preparation, most people shouldn't be surprised necessarily in a, in a public context. You're, you're hearing some of this feedback from investors along the way. So what are you doing to make sure your messages are clear or that you're responding to it before someone forces that conversation in a public lens? You know, I'd like to get reactions. So we, you talked about the universal proxy, and we're already seeing that with some clients where activists are proposing full slates because I think they feel like, well, it's the same to propose a full slate as a half slate, so we'll go ahead. So we're seeing it. Universal proxies, it's here. Um, interestingly, last week, you know, BlackRock made an announcement with regard to letting their end investors you know, vote their shares. And as you guys know, every, every company, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, they all own between 5 and 10%. Um, and... What, what they suggested was that, you know, create a mechanism for, for their, in effect, their clients mm -hmm. to, to vote through on proxies. And um, there's a lot of discussion about what that will mean, whether the power of the big funds will be more diffuse or whether it's more symbolic. So I'm curious whether you guys have thought about it or what you think, you know, whether whether it's retail or smaller funds that are, end up having to or want to make decisions on proxy matters? You know, on, on some level, it's a, it's a clever move. It's, it's defensive on some level because for a long time, there's been a, <clears throat> an increasing chorus of these funds have way too much power and they're making decisions okay. and voting and pushing agendas, et cetera. And you're starting to see things like the anti-ESG movement. I wouldn't count out ESG, but you're starting to see countervailing forces here, and so they're getting out ahead of it on some level. And why don't we let, why don't we let our ultimate beneficial holders, if you'd like, make the decision? I, I think it's a clever move. But. I also look at the proxy advisory firms, right, ISS and Glass-Lewis, and I have to think that over time, I'm not sure, like, full slate will have traction. That would be a very high bar to reach, right? But it's going to be the why not type of approach for, like, one or two. And that's what will be making the universal proxy so much interesting because you're right, the cost to entry to have proxy material be included, right, is very low, relatively speaking. Um, the days of the blue card and the gold card and the race to, to, to secure that are gone. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how many boards end up. And, you know, all it takes within a boardroom, having been through it once or twice, is one or two new fresh voices mm -hmm. that really start to ask hard questions. And all of a sudden, that can sort of turn the ship rel very quickly in many respects. You planted the seed about restructuring. Um, and before we will spend the last maybe 10 minutes talking about the uh, predictions that you all want to make that will hopefully come true by next year. Um, but how, how much of a role do you think the, that out is, sort of those sort of restructuring deals? Is that going to be a dual track that people end up having to pursue? Is that going to be something that people want to clean a lot of their balance sheet up because they just need to get out from underneath the liabilities that are there? I'm just curious if you have thoughts about that, again, based on maybe historical times. Some, like they're gonna, the pub, some of these public companies are gonna have to, but I don't know that, it's like I can think of a growth company that probably is gonna fit into that traditional restructuring mode. The growth companies are gonna, I think, get more creative, be willing to go take a pipe or be willing to do a direct lending facility or something like that, because unless the premise of the company is challenged, they should ultimately, over a longer period of time, be able to grow and, and get enough value through it. Um, on the older school, like traditional, more mature side of tech, I'm sure there's going to be restructurings. And, and I think in the private company context, mm -hmm. where you have the unicornish, uh, whether they're unicorn still or not, 
um, it's going to be more appetizing to take them through a 363 process. You know, a public company bankruptcy is tremendously expensive, disrupting, mm -hmm. you know, talent issues, all, all the rest of it, right? So for a mid-sized publicly traded tech company to go through an actual bankruptcy, I think is that's just not that common. But if you're on the buy side and you're looking at a balance sheet and you're saying, I don't want to have fraudulent conveyance issues, I don't want to have the creditors coming after me, I can get most of the creditors to sign off, but not all of them, then you know that's where the workouts come in and that's where the classic kind of, maybe it's not an actual bankruptcy, it's just a, a bunch of mutual releases and leaving the debt behind. But there's, you know, to Paul's point, I agree completely, it's time for creativity and rolling up the sleeves and it's not just, you know, what's the multiple and here's a, here's a term sheet and can we get a deal done in three days? These are deals that stretch out. Yeah, and also there's a difference too. Private and public companies are differently situated in, in this when you think about it. Being a public company, we've talked about it, has a lot of downsides, but it has a lot of advantages too. In tough times, you have a currency that you can actually go out and sell. And you have public filings and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. It, it's more difficult to do that as a private company. It, it just is. And so you, you do have that one ace in the hole potentially as a public company mm -hmm. seller in really tough times. Brittany, I'm going to pick up on a conversation you and I were having before we walked on stage. Uh, the, the companies are obviously trying to seek capital, right? Because they need to fund operations, and of course, they're going to wait till the very last minute. But how many folks are coming to you? Again, probably private companies, right? Looking for those introductions, looking for that, and 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 how are those conversations going? Like, what's? I'm just curious, the climate kind of behind the scenes. It's starting to increase because of the venture capital community and the amount of capital that was available then, growth, even corporate venture. A lot of companies actually entered this downturn with a fair amount of capital. It's not everyone, but a lot mm -hmm. did. You know, we started this with maybe you know, some of the average software growth companies having three years of capital. Mm -hmm. And now we're kind of one year into you know, this being a, challenging, being a challenging environment. A lot of the companies are wanting to defer a conversation on value. So there's been a lot more conversation of, oh, should we actually take on debt mm -hmm. or take on some form of a convertible or revolver, depending on how much cash they need. At some point, this is going to turn into, I just need money and I need, and I'm going to have to reprice my equity. We're not like fully there yet if I'm to generalize where we are in the landscape, but I suspect that over the next 12 months we are. And by the way, not all of these companies who are looking to debt really are going to be well-placed because you owe back the debt at some point. You're going to have to pay it back. And so you have to have a line of sight to say, okay, depending on the terms, in three years, I'm going to be able to handle this maturity. And so, yes, I don't have to decide on the value today, but there is no free lunch, as they say. Like, you're going to have to deal with it at some point. And so there's starting to be a little bit more rationalization in some conversations we're having of, all right, maybe I'm actually going to do a blend of this. I am going to reprice the equity and do some, do some portion of the capital I need in equity, and I'll do the other part in, in debt. That, I think, is going to accelerate as we get into next year because we're going to be running down the balance sheets and the macro is going to be tough here. For We can debate for how long, but there's pr pretty much no debate, at least for the next handful of quarters. The world's probably only going to get tougher before it gets easier. Okay, so we'll go into the bold predictions. Uh, and I don't want to pick on the poor DSPACs, but I suspect, just to lead things off, that we're not going to see any more of that uh, product being used for the foreseeable future. But where else would your minds go? Back to creativity, Paul, you mentioned. So either from, you know, I would so, love, that's, love You it. know, if, if we're talking predictions, I, you know, I mean, the, the one thing we really haven't dwelled on too much is just is, is antitrust. When we think about M&A, we think about antitrust. Unfortunately, now more than we did in the past, I, I'd say. Uh, antitrust has ramped up in aggressiveness, I think, as we all know. That is likely to continue. The midterm elections weren't we're never going to change that. It, the only thing it'll change will be potentially if there's a changeover in the next administration. But just what we have seen lately and what is continuing, you know, the the agencies in the United States are more willing to sue rather than negotiate. We're seeing a lot of unusual things happen. You get to the end of the 30-day HSR waiting period, and a second request comes in. Um, you know, we see the agencies being less willing to accept fixes and sue, even though their track record hasn't been good lately. I mean, they they got one victory with the Simon Schuster Penguin deal, but they lost a series of cases. 
and we're seeing more novel theories of harm that are being trotted out in terms of things like effect on labor and nation peddlers and things like that. Uh, all of it puts a lot of pressure on getting deals done, uh, you know, certainly at the front end of making sure that either side is not creating so-called bad documents. Mm -hmm. Things like a PowerPoint that says the reason to do this deal is to eliminate our principal competitor. <laughs> uh, you know, we counsel clients all the time, don't, put, don't write things like that down. It's illegal in this country to do, th to do deals for that reason. Uh, but there's other things we're seeing as well. I mean, just the, with the level of antitrust scrutiny, drop dead dates are getting pushed out. What used to be a six, six month drop dead date, maybe now it's 12 or 15. If you need financing, that now puts a tremendous amount of pressure on financing because the banks aren't gonna give you another six to nine months for free. And in this market, they may not give it to you at all. Puts a lot of pressure on sellers too. Instead of a six month interim period, you now may be twisting in the wind 12 to 15 months. Are you sure you can run the business that long? Do you need more flexibility in the interim operating covenant? So it, it's putting, it, there are a lot of challenges. I, I see that continuing to be a challenge going forward, over, certainly over the next 12 months. Uh, and, and remember, as bad as we think we have it over here, it, at least to get a deal done if we're facing a challenge from the agencies, at least they have to litigate in the, in the courts to stop the deal. It's, it's even worse over across the pond where the EU and CMA are essentially judge, jury, and executioner and can stop a deal all by themselves. I see it as a continued challenge. Thank you. IPOs are going to come back. I don't think the IPO is dead. They're going to start <laughs> dripping out again second, third quarter next year in a more meaningful way. I don't think it's going to be every company that was originally thinking they were going public this year that's all of a sudden going to hit the market at once. I think it's going to be slower because some of these companies haven't performed as well as they you know, thought they would have, so it's not gonna be as, as great of a public story, or many are looking at M&A, buy side or sell side, so there's gonna be a slow, slow drip out, and then strategic M&A will be there, in addition to the ongoing sponsor activity that we've been seeing. We've talked about activism, so I won't belabor it, but I wanted to point one thing out, which is, now is a good time, given the valuation resets, to huddle with your banker and look at your rights plan and your rights plan valuations for the flip in, flip over provisions, because those are probably reset some. And you, you know, we all keep them on the shelf, and we think a hostel is highly unlikely, but you never know when you're going to need it, and it's good to be prepared in that respect. The other thing I would say is you got a whole dose yesterday on from from the vice chancellors who were here on MFW and conflicts of interest and related party type transactions. With these scarcity of capital, it's more likely, it's more tempting for an existing investor to try to bail out the company. That creates more conflicts. And we'll see more 13E3 deals, which is the federal securities uh, high disclosure level, right? And we'll see more entire fairness type of situations in Delaware, which I think means like Randy Barron, who was here yesterday, will be very happy because there'll be more opportunity for the plaintiff side bar to investigate uh, conflicts, and, and lawyers have got to mind their P's and Q's in ensuring that boards really do run a clean process in workout type situations. All right, well, I have a list. All right, okay. let's do it. <laughs> Down replaces Twitter. Hoka replaces Allbirds. Uh, loud Firing, we talked about, replaces Quiet Quitting. Industrial Bankers uh, replace Crypto Bankers as exciting places to be. <laughs> uh, Robinhood gets acquired by Reddit. Uh, M&A comes roaring back. Uh, I think the embers of this year will create the seeds of next year for, for some of the reasons that Brittany cited that maybe rates attenuate, uh, maybe we're at the other side of this inflation surge. And m and is, um, it's seasonal, it tends to track. You would think that buyers would be opportunistic, but most of the time m and tends to track the S&P with the lag. Um, and so we'll see what happens with the equity markets. But it does feel like um, that 23 could be a year where we see a lot of opportunistic and, and certainly more strategic deals and a lot more activism. I mean, it's here, it's coming. You're gonna see, um, you're gonna see a lot of announcements since we're now, we're basically in the window of nominations if you have a more or less a spring annual meeting season. And if you have an advanced bylaw provision, this is the time you're hearing uh, mm -hmm. from activists. And we are, we are seeing that with our, with our clients. And then the social activists and the anti-ESG anti activists. So you have Thrive, 
um, out there now with a very large megaphone writing letters, and you're going to see them probably submitting slates um, on the other side of the ESG argument. So I think that's going to make for certainly a lot of fertile discussions with, you know, with investors. You know, and some of these reinforce each other, right? I mean, mm -hmm. an increase in activism tends to lead to an increase in, in M&A transactions. Mm -hmm. You know, the decline in valuations and suffering under debt loads tends to lead to restructuring. So some of these reinforce each other and actually catalyze transactions as well. I know there was a, a rumor of hope that one of our big tech companies would, you know, be the catalyst that kicked open the IPO gates. Do you guys think there'll be any sort of deal or any type of uh, industry that the activist might be interested in, or again, that IPO might be the right type of sector to kick things off? Well, I'm going with Brittany's point that we're going to see a bunch of IPOs, so we're, we're hoping. <laughs> All of them we get. <laughs> well, you're also seeing sort of like the Intel Mobileye example from yesterday, you're seeing strategic unwindings of, of, mm -hmm. of you know, as companies look at their portfolios. So. Some may be very market related, like valuations are great, but some are just going to be, we need to do this for broader strategic reasons and we'll, we'll you know, maybe we won't sell the whole thing so we won't look like, am I allowed to say taking schmuck insurance if, you know, sellers will keep some equity, whatever, whatever, you know, contingent value rights, whatever creative ways um, bankers and you guys structured deals, um, regardless of sort of where the equity markets are. And you're always going to see a, a good amount of that. And you know, we're certainly seeing that. Yeah, I mean, deals that made sense a few years ago don't. And so Intel Mobileye is an example. I think creativity, and, and you've heard a lot of doom and gloom up here, but I, it isn't all doom and gloom. And, and frankly, even over the last short period of time, there have been sizable transactions announced. You know, Emerson selling its climate business to Blackstone, mm -hmm. a private equity sponsor for $14 billion. There's one example, J&J &J buying a biomed for $16 billion. There have been large transactions even in the last several weeks here. So it's, you know... Need for creativity, savvy deal doers who can pragmatically weigh risk. There will, there will continue to be deals done, but it, it's just going to be a bit of a challenging period, I'd say, going forward. I agree with the, the positive spin on the environment, which is there is still capital. There are large pools of capital. Right now, it is a bit of a question of price, but it's better than a situation where there isn't pools mm -hmm. of capital. There's buyers. There's going to continue to be buyers that are in relative positions of, of strength, and so you're going to see activity there. And there's a need for growth. There's a need for innovation. And in a labor-challenged world, like I think technology in particular is going to play, continue to play a role in that for decades to come because if we can't find the people, mm -hmm. we're going to have to figure out how to get all this work done some other way, and, and companies are going to fill these gaps. And, and it, maybe a final thought, if you look at technology M&A in the past six months, it's the one area where it's been sustained a little bit, right? Okay. And so it is not all doom and gloom. And how lucky are those of us in the Bay Area and in the tech sector who are practicing in an area where the drive for efficiency, the drive for scale mm -hmm. keeps on propagating a bunch of wonderful companies that come up, get sold, reinvent themselves, and the founders go on to the next great gig. Awesome. I didn't have to ask you to end on a positive note. I appreciate it. I will hold on to that. Thank you all for your time. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, all your wisdom is very valued. Thank you. Thank you.